Good morning. It is great to see everyone here at First Methodist. I am glad to see all the uh, people who could who knew how to uh, uh, listen to their their phones this morning as we sprung forward. It's the uh, the greatest morning of the year. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, but I am so glad to have all of you here this morning uh, uh, as we have sprung forward. Uh, my name is Michael Blackburn, one of the uh, staff members here. And please don't leave without getting one of our three-month calendars. We have all our upcoming events on the front of it, um, everything that goes through Easter and Lent, um, all the way to the beginning of summer there. And in the back, it has descriptions of all our ongoing programs so we can get yourself, um, your child, or your youth connected. We also have our red pads that are that Bev's passing out now. If you see them at the end of the um, aisle there, sometime during the service, make sure you sign in. Let us know that you're here. And I hope that everyone has picked up their um, church devotion books. If you haven't, we've got plenty still back in the in the back there. You can also do it online. But um, all, all these devotions were written by church members, people who are here in this room here this morning. Um, but it's a great way for us as we get closer to, to Easter uh, to be able to read together as a church family as we go into Lent. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad that we're all here this morning in this place. That I know it's early. I know it's, it's, it's different. It's uncomfortable. Worship should be that way. So let's all uh, stand this morning as we sing our faith and, uh, and we just we lift our voices up this morning.
I have another welcome here this morning. So glad to have you again. My name is Michael Blackburn, one of the staff members, and want to welcome you to our awakening service. Uh, we got a lot of stuff going on. If you look in your bulletins this morning, um, all kinds of things you can uh, sign up for. If you get to the purple one, you'll see we have Wonderful Wednesday. We've got a great meal. Uh, we'd love for you to get connected there. Also, uh, Music Makers will be going on on Wednesday along with uh, Youth Music Lab. So I hope uh, uh, you can get connected there. Um, we talked about it earlier about our, uh, our devotion books and our Shadows of Lent that, that are written here. We do have hard copies in the back, but if you're interested in, um, in getting them by email, they come every morning about 5.30 to your phone or, or however you get your email. If you'd like to, you can either sign up online or you can also just fill this out right here. Um, put it in the offering plate or take it to the office and they'll make sure uh, you get it and you'll be able to uh, get your email all set up that way with that. Next Sunday, we've right after this service, um, we're going to be tearing this. Uh, we're going to be tearing things down in here. We're going to have another lunch and learn. Our missions committee is bringing in um, who's coming in. This is the Blue Ridge Health or the Good Samaritan. Yeah, the, the, the Blue Ridge Health will be coming in, which is formerly known as the Good Samaritan Clinic. Uh, we'll be able to find out more about what's going on with that. It's a great way of getting connected with the missions that our church is a part of and things that are going on here in Haywood County. Um, if you'd like to sign up for that, you can do that right here and either bring it in uh, to the office this week or put in the offering plate uh, today with that. And we'll be able to um, sign up for that probably all the way up until it, but please let us know RSVP that way. Uh, youth, we're on regular schedule this week. Breakfast and Bible Tuesday at the um, high school, Thursday at the middle school music lab. Uh, tonight, we've got Emily Patton's going to be speaking to us. We had a great... Uh, talk last week by Haley Bennington and looking forward to as our seniors continue to uh, share with us so I hope that all the our youth can come tonight those are the announcements that I know of is there something I might have missed awesome let's all Sing together. Let your name, the mountain shake and crumble. Let your name, the oceans roll and tumble. Let your name.
invite you in this place this morning that we might connect with you and feel your love be wrapped in your grace be held in your mercy thanks be to God for all that you do amen sit your voices sing this
It's time to sing your song again. to come forward as we give our gifts back. is full light and shadow oh the joy and oh the sorrow oh the sorrow life is full light and shadow oh the joy Oh, the 
passado Yet will he bring dark to light Yet will he bring day from morning. Congratulations, you guys made it. It's pretty awesome. You know, Kevin Brock, one of our esteemed keyboard players, had a great positive view, and uh, Mike sent out the text to the band and said, hey guys, don't forget tomorrow's Spring Forward, which usually meets with a litany of follow-up texts with a lot of groans and whines and whatnot. And Kevin just said, well, look at it this way. We lost one hour of rain last night, so <laughs> that was pretty good. So thanks, Kevin. This is a time in our service where we come together and, and pray together, lifting up those who need our prayers, uh, raising up our joys in thanksgiving to the Lord. So how can we pray together this morning?
Yes, Melanie. Prayers for safe passage for all those college kids to and fro. Let's bow in prayer. God, we give thanks that we're here today, that we can come together in your name and sing songs about your love and your grace and hear the word brought forth so that we may grow in our faith. God, we lift up all that need our prayers, those who are on our hearts that may be going unspoken this morning, those that are in the bulletin that are either recovering from some sort of illness or in the middle of an illness or dealing with all sorts of issues, God, we, we pray that, that they know that you're there, that they're not alone. God, we ask your, your blessing upon all that we do here in this church and that we continue to stay committed and stay focused on shining your light, even though when things around us seem to be in turmoil and there seems to be uncertainty, that, that we can put aside those things and just focus on you and let you be at the center of all that we do. And if we do that, we know that we'll be in the right place. God, we ask your blessing on all that are here and those that we missed this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Todd. Good morning. Thank you all for making it today. I'm Keith and I'm the senior pastor and I'm excited about our first Sunday in Lent together. Our text that is often read um, on the first Sunday of Lent is from Luke chapter 4, and so today we, we follow Jesus into the wilderness. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days. And when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority. For it has been given over to me, and I will give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Lori Brant Hale is a, a professor at, at Augsburg College in Minneapolis, and she writes about uh, a conversation she has with her three-year-old three son. And it's after he has experienced uh, the story we just read, uh, the story of, of Jesus' wilderness temptation, uh, after he had experienced that in children's church or, or in the children's worship experience at their church. And he said, hey, Mom, what do you know about the devil? And as a theologian, her, her mind just started uh, racing about all of the possibilities and, and all of the ways that she could respond until she, she realized that it was her three-year-old son who was asking it. And she just kind of paused and, and just flipped the question back to him. And, and she was like, well, honey, um, what do you know about the devil? He says, well, the devil talked to Jesus. 
And of course, as a as a good mom, she's like, "Well, that's good. He was he was paying attention." <laughs> and then he says, "The devil was mean." And leaning a little closer and and dropping his voice uh, to to a, a whisper, he says, "If we were at a store." And you and dad were in one aisle, and and I was in another aisle, and then he dropped his voice even lower to kind of a more conspiratorial tone, and there was candy, and he paused for the effect. The devil would say, you should take some. She said, honey, if we were at the store and your dad and I were in one aisle and you were in another aisle and there was candy and the devil said, you should take some, what would you say back to the devil? A genuinely sweet grin lit up his entire face and without hesitation he says, Oh, I would say, thank you. <laughs> now, I, I feel fairly comfortable saying um, that we've all had this experience in one form or another. Um, but I, I can only speak for myself when I say that I'm ashamed that uh, many times I respond like a three-year-old. Uh, Jesus has been there, too. Uh, His candy aisle uh, was the wilderness, and he too was alone. There was was nobody looking uh, when the temptations came. And yet, uh, Jesus' response was different. And I really think that as much as there is for us to say about this story of of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, at the heart of it, at least one of the main themes, if not the main point, Um, is Jesus' response. So when you stop and think about it, uh, this struggle that Jesus had in the wilderness, the the temptations really aren't that bad. So, like, everyone has to eat. Not only, you know, do we have to eat, we believe that it was very intentional on God's part to to create us needy. (laughs) You know, so... If you have the power to turn a rock into a piece of bread, and I would argue that while you're at it, you might as well turn the little tiny stones into coffee beans. Don't you agree? But if you had the power to do that, what's so bad about that? And if Jesus had the power to do that, imagine for just a moment like where he was. Imagine that landscape. And you can see all of the rocks that were all over Palestine. (laughs) No one would be hungry. And and if you think about the world in in Jesus' day, politically, I mean, Rome was in control. In in fact, it was a a heavy-handed control of every aspect of life. And they had uh, a a powerful military handle on things. So it... It could be easy to argue. I mean, I think I could make a strong argument that for Jesus, King Jesus, to be on the throne would mean that the world was a much more beautiful place, was much more what it should be. And uh, I I think uh, that's the candy that Jesus saw. And then staging showy demonstrations to to kind of prove to the world that Jesus actually was God's man. I mean, that could easily seem like a better idea than the the demonstration that that ended up on a cross. So each one of Jesus' responses to these temptations is a very clear reminder to Israel's experience in the wilderness. You know, Israel following Moses... They were led out of Egypt where they had been slaves for so long. They came through the Red Sea and into the wilderness. And they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years. And, you know, if you're familiar, at least to some degree, with the story of God's people in Egypt, uh, you know that, I mean, there was um, grumbling for bread. 
They, they flirted disastrously with idolatry, worshiping the wrong things, and they continually put God to the test. Uh, N.T. Wright, as he writes about this, uh, he's a, a, a British New Testament scholar. It helped me to kind of get this sense of uh, what Jesus was facing um, in, in this wilderness time. He says, Jesus comes through the waters of baptism as God's unique son, the one through whom Israel's destiny was to be fulfilled. He faces the question, how is he to be Israel's representative, her rightful king? How can he deliver Israel and thereby the world from the grip of the enemy? How can he bring about the real liberation, not just from Rome and other political foes, but from the arch enemy, the devil himself? The answer is that he must begin by defeating him at the most personal and intimate level. This story is about obeying God. And Jesus does. Jesus obeys God. So I think you and I, we can find ourselves in wilderness places. We can find ourselves being tempted onto a path that God never intended for us to go. I've not actually been in the wilderness, but I plan to. I don't have any specific plans. Um, but, but I hear people tell me that the wilderness is not just a harsh, desolate, cruel, dry, hot place. That the wilderness actually can, can be quite amazing and extremely beautiful. Temptation comes in things both dark and beautiful. On, on Wednesday, it was Ash Wednesday, and a lot of us gathered in the, the sanctuary upstairs for the Ash Wednesday service. And every year for that service, um, the, the same scriptures are recommended for use in that service. There's the, the Old Testament passage from Joel. There's a passage from 2 Corinthians that we use every now and again. Uh, Psalm 51, which, which David wrote. Um, which is about confession and repentance, and then the gospel lesson. The gospel lesson is a familiar one. We just used it a few weeks ago when, in our worship series on the Lord's Prayer. Um, it's from Matthew chapter 6, and it's that, that section where Jesus is giving some instruction about when you give, don't give so that everybody can see you. you know, give in secret. When you're fasting, don't you know, put oil on your head. Don't let everybody know that you're fasting. You know, God who sees you in secret. And, and says, when you pray, go into your closet alone. Don't pray so that everybody can see you. God will see you. And in the secret place, alone with God, God who knows all things, God will speak to you. God will hold you. I mean, I'm elaborating on, you know, a little bit, but, but Jesus does say, um, and God who sees in secret uh, will reward you. So Jesus from an amazing experience of baptism where the Holy Spirit comes and holds him, rests on him, where he hears an affirmation. That's what happens in a secret place. God affirms my value, convicts me of my sin, but affirms my value as a child of God. Jesus, without sin, comes out of the waters of baptism and is affirmed as as the Son of God, and it says the Spirit led him into this wilderness place alone. You know, I think like Jesus, our metal is tested there in that place. And I remember that who I am in secret, that's who I am. I get pulled in the wrong directions. You know, the battle is, this is my desire. This is what I want. And, and really the ultimate question is, uh, what is it that God wants? And that's the other side of this whole temptation thing. It's knowing God. It's knowing what God wants. And I think if we took that instruction by, of Jesus for us to go into the secret place, into this closet place where, where, where God will meet us and where, where God will reward us, if we, if we just started listing, okay, what are those rewards? It's actually not a bad exercise to do. I think we come up with lots of great things, but I think at the very heart of it, and one of the greatest things is that I come out of that knowing that God is God. I know who God is. At the, at the very basic level, I know that God is real and that there's something amazing going on. 
That's why this discipline is so important for us. We can begin to know what it is that God wants. It enables us to have a, a, a clear way forward. This is what I'm supposed to do with my life. This is what we're supposed to do with our life. You know, we, we can choose the right path and not the wrong path. Yeah. You know, in this season of Lent, we're going we're gonna, to, as we follow Jesus into the shadows of Lent, we're going to talk about this place where Jesus kind of turns to those of us following and says, you know, I never promised you that it's going to be easy. He says, the way is actually tough. And he, he paints this picture of it's a narrow door. It's not a wide, easy door where everybody can just flood through. It's a narrow door. And, and not everybody chooses it. So I know it's March and we're just jumping into March Madness. But I think, I think spring training is also starting somewhere in Florida. And so I want to just share a, a baseball illustration uh, Dave Boswell he wrote a book, How Life Imitates the World Series. And he tells a story um, about Hall of Fame manager Earl Weaver. He's a, f- a former manager of the Baltimore Orioles. Um, and he talks about how he managed uh, superstar outfielder uh, Reggie Jackson. Well, Earl Weaver had this rule that nobody is to steal second base or any base unless they get the steal sign from the dugout. Well, this upset Reggie Jackson because Reggie Jackson knew he was a superstar. He knew what he could do, and that was kind of, that was kind of his thing. He's like, I know these pitchers. I know these catchers. I know my greatness or, or lack thereof, depending on who's on the mound. Like, I should be the one to decide when I steal a base. And so one game, he decided to steal without uh, a sign from the manager, and he got a, a, a good jump off the pitcher, and he easily beat the throw from the catcher and slid into second base uh, and, and was safe. And he's dusting off, you know, his uniform, and he's got this huge grin on his face, just feeling like he's, he's been vindicated, you know, to his manager at, as his decision uh, to do that. Well, later, after the game, Earl Weaver took Reggie Jackson aside, and, and he explained why he hadn't given him the steal sign. Well, first, the next batter was Lee May, And Lee May was also an amazing hitter. He was the second most powerful hitter, second only to Reggie Jackson. So when Jackson stole second base, it left first base open. And so the other team intentionally walked Lee May um, and essentially taking the bat right out of his hands. Well, second, Weaver explained, is the next batter had historically been awful against this pitcher, like so bad in his career against this pitcher that uh, Weaver really had no choice but to take him out of the game and bring in a pinch hitter and try to get the guys on base to home plate. So that left Weaver without bench strength for later in the game when he needed it. So the, the problem was Reggie Jackson saw only his relationship to the pitcher, and to the catcher. Earl Weaver was watching the whole game. You know, we can only see so far. And we trust that God sees the big picture. We trust that God knows what's going on. And it's God that we trust. It's God that we obey. And we follow Jesus into the shadows of Lent, and we know that it can be done. Will you pray with me? God, sometimes we feel lost. Sometimes we feel like we're in a wilderness place, and sometimes it it seems dark. And we feel afraid. But we also know that sometimes it's quite beautiful. It's like candy. And there's no fear, only danger. We've got our life figured out. Sometimes we know just how it should be done. But we also know that it's it's your way. It's you that we're following. It's you that we need to obey. 
as we come to know you, we just come to know that you know. And I pray for us today that we can, as we continue to worship, hear your voice, know your call, confess the dark things, resist those things we need to resist, even if they're beautiful, even if they seem so right. And in our closet place, in our wilderness place, the beauty of your words will lift us and inspire us. Show us the way. Help us, God, to go your way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for our last song.
You know that song just reminds me is as bad as I feel at the times that I mess up and don't obey as God wants me to. Um, Jesus was with the Spirit and he really wasn't alone. And this is a true promise. God doesn't give up on us. It doesn't matter how many times we get it wrong. Uh, God helps us to get it right. And that's, a, that's a, a good thing to carry with us as we go. Thanks for coming today. And now let's go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and this love of God that never runs out and the communion of the Holy Spirit. God bless you and go in the peace of Christ. Amen. <laughs>